Well, I don't know about you, but when I left the house for college, I moved down Slide Road and my mom lost it, right? I mean, she was upset, crying, tears, hugs, kisses, you know, just all of it, right? When my brother Travis left, I just went down Slide. My brother Travis went to Lake Tahoe Community College that's quite a distance from here. And so when he hooked up that U-Haul trailer and left our house, my mom ran into the street, fell on her knees with her arms up in the sky, screaming and praying and crying. I had to like come and scoop her up off the street and bring her back into the house. That's the way my mom reacted when we left for school. I've realized recently that I've only got a few years left with my oldest son, Levi. He's 16, he started driving. We don't see him a whole lot. And I started thinking this past week, I'm like, man, I've only got three years left with him. But then there's some days, <laughs> parents, where you're like, gosh, three more years of this? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how we're gonna make it. That, that process is painful, right? It, but, but at the same time, it's natural and it's healthy because it's not healthy for grown men in their 20s to live as consumers off of their parents, right? Having everything provided for them so that they can play Xbox all day. That, that's not healthy, right? It's not healthy to do nothing but consume. And yet, a lot of us had that kind of relationship with the church. We had that kind of relationship with our spiritual life. We had this unhealthy view of church in our spiritual life that says, I'm a consumer and all I do is consume the church and consume from the mission of Jesus. It's an unhealthy view. And so we've got consumers in the church that don't contribute. Now, at our church, I never thought that we would be a church that like grows really fast just because of our style, because of the way that we preach, we go verse by verse, it's a little bit more serious, right? We, we've said from the beginning, we're not really about crowds and about numbers. We, we want a, a family of disciples that are making disciples. And so I never thought we would grow that fast, but our church has been growing at like 30 to 40% compared to last year this time. So we've been growing and we've got a lot of people coming and consuming, but not contributing. And so part of the challenge in that, when you go to a new place and you start consuming, maybe at a new church that you're getting involved in, is there's got to come a day where you begin to contribute, where you give back with your time by serving and, and plugging into a ministry and, 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 and ministering to other people through your serving, through your time, through, through giving. We don't pass an offering plate here, but You've got to make that transition at a certain point where you, do, you, just, you go from consuming to beginning to consume and contribute. That's a healthy relationship with the church and with your spiritual life. And, and we do the same thing with the mission of Jesus. We consume from people who are investing and giving financially to the mission of Jesus, but we're not contributing to the mission of Jesus. This is an unhealthy relationship with the church and with your spiritual life. And we're gonna to see today that Jesus is going to take these consumers that have been following him and that he's been spending time with, time with, so much time with for the past three years, they've been consuming from him, but Jesus is now going to send them out as contributors to the kingdom of God. They've been consuming from him, but now it's time. He's going back to the Father, he's gonna send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to empower his disciples who've been consumers to now become contributors. If you got your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, we are finishing a two year journey through the gospel of Luke. We are finishing it today. Next week, we are gonna start a new series for three weeks called Creed. It's a series we come back to each year where we cover a different point of Christian theology. This year, we're gonna be talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So starting next week, we're gonna take three weeks and talk about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What is baptism in the Spirit? What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Walk in the Spirit, live by the Spirit, and what are the roles of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Then after that, we're gonna take three weeks 
and do a series called Countercultural. We're going to talk about what the Bible has to say about gender, sexuality, and our approach to a culture that has rejected and even reviles what the Bible has to say about gender and sexuality. And a lot of people in our day like to think that Jesus had nothing to say about gender and sexuality. That's false. He had plenty to say about it. We're gonna dive into that and what Jesus had to say and what Jesus believes about gender and sexuality. So that, that's the next kind of six or seven weeks. Today, we're finishing the Gospel of Luke. And our challenge throughout this series for the last two years has been to engage. Don't sit back and watch as if this is theater. You'll be watching your watch. You'll be looking at the clock. You'll be bored to tears. Our challenge has been to engage. like. Get out our app, take notes, read your Bible, study and engage, and you might just find God speaking to you. And that's the most exciting thing in the world. You'll be on the edge of your seat. You'll be in church on the edge of your seat because you're gonna hear God speaking to you if you will lean forward and you will engage. And so get out our app. It's called the City Church Lubbock. You can download it in your app store. Go to message notes. The verses and the points are there. You can fill in the blank as we go. It's a great way to stay engaged in our time together. We challenge you to engage in the gospel of Luke with our city groups, our small group Bible studies. Now's a great time to get plugged into one. Um, If you're new here or you're not in a group, lots of people are getting involved in groups right now. So pull out that connection card in the seat back in front of you, fill it out, check the box that says you're interested in small groups. Uh, We call them city groups here and Pastor Brandon will be in touch with you. We've challenged you to engage in the gospel of Luke. There are daily devotionals. It's a Bible study resource under the Bible study tab on our app. Monday through Friday, we're gonna break down these same verses and provide some more prayer points and application points throughout this week. And then finally, we've challenged you to engage in the Gospel of Luke by studying the Gospel of Luke with your family using the Table Talk. The Table Talk is a Bible study resource under the Bible study tab on our app. Your kids right now, our students right now are studying these same verses. And so the table talk allows a family to get around a lunch table or a dinner table and talk about what they learned in the gospel of Luke or at church today. So engage our prayer. That was our challenge. Our prayer in studying the gospel of Luke for the last two years is that you would get to know Jesus, not conservative Jesus, not liberal Jesus, but the Jesus of the scriptures, the full counsel of Jesus. And here's what Paul said. Here's been our prayer, Philippians chapter three. Here's what Paul said about getting to know Jesus is better than anything else. Nothing compares to knowing, following, serving, and worshiping Jesus. Nothing, he said, in Philippians three, he said, I count everything else a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Here's what Paul is saying. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than anything you got. Jesus is better than anything you got going on. Jesus is better than anything you're giving yourself to. Jesus is better. And so our prayer has been in this series that you will get to know Jesus and find him better than anything you've got or than anything you've got going on. So Jesus in Luke chapter 24, Jesus has died. He's been raised from the dead. Now what? So Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 27 Emily's gonna come and read the scriptures for us this morning. Would you stand in honor of the word of the Lord? And as you stand, I wanna remind you about what Jesus said about his word that we are about to read. He said, you will always have my words. My words will never pass away. So we take Jesus at his word. We believe that Jesus is the son of God. We don't believe Jesus is a liar. Jesus said we would always have his word. So what we have today is the word of the Lord. Emily, would you come and read for us? Hello, I'm Emily Luera. I serve on the prayer and intercessory teams and my husband Jacob and I also lead a city group. Let's read. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my father promised but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So they worshiped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. And they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. Thank you, Emily. you may be seated. 
So Jesus rises from the grave. He starts appearing to his apostles, to his followers. In Acts chapter 1, which kind of mirrors the end of Luke 24, both are written by Luke. In Acts chapter 1, it says for 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples. He hung out with them. He ate with them. He, he, he spoke with them. So, so these aren't just one-time experiences that the disciples have where they see the risen Jesus. They see Jesus risen from the grave, hang out with him, talk with him, touch him. Acts 1 says for 40 days, they saw Jesus and hung out with Jesus and talked with Jesus and, and, and ate with Jesus. So now what we're reading here in Luke 24 is 40 days after Jesus has risen from the grave. 40 days later, Acts chapter one says, Jesus's time on earth has come to an end. And what we're reading today in Luke 24, at the very end of Luke 24, the last few verses in the gospel of Luke are the two final chapters of Jesus's time here on earth. The two final chapters. Here's the first one. Number one, Jesus sins. Jesus sins. We call this the great commission. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples of all the nations. In Acts 1 verse 8, here's what Jesus told his disciples. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. We call this the Great Commission, where Jesus sends his disciples out to go and make disciples. They've been consuming from Jesus over the last three years, but now Jesus says, you're going to be sent out. You're going to contribute to the kingdom of God. You're going to go and make disciples. So let's talk about the Great Commission. Number one, we are sent without an option. Sent without an option. The Great Commission is not optional. Here in Luke chapter 24, Jesus says this, you are witnesses of all these things. This is a command. It's not a question. It's not a suggestion. Jesus isn't saying, hey guys, you know what? If I know you, you've got busy schedules and um, I know you've got a lot going on, like you've got baseball practice and football practice and cheer and, and soccer. Like I know you've got all these things going on. You know what? If you got any time left over, um, would you mind if you could get around to it, making disciples of all the nations. This isn't a question. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. You are witnesses of all these things. Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go. All authority is mine. I'm the boss. I'm telling you, Go and make disciples of all the nations. This is a command, it's not a question. It's why in Acts chapter four, when Peter and John are told to stop speaking about the name of Jesus, quit talking about this man, Jesus, who rose from the grave, the Sanhedrin warned Peter and John, if you keep talking about this man, we're gonna beat you, we're gonna throw you in prison. They warn them to stop talking about Jesus. And what do Peter and John say? Judge for yourselves, whether it's right in God's sight to obey you, or God, what are they saying there? We've got to obey God. We can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard because we must obey God. Witnessing of Jesus, making disciples in all the nations for Jesus is a matter of obedience or disobedience. That's all there is to it. In fact, Peter would say in Acts chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus ordered us to preach. It's an order. It's not a question. It's not a suggestion. Jesus is King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. He has ordered us to go and to preach, to make disciples of all the nations. Peter would say it like, or Paul would say it like this. You are an ambassador for Christ as though, watch this, God was making his appeal to the world through you. You're an ambassador of Jesus. God is making his appeal to your world through you, to your circle, through you, to your family members, friends, coworkers, and neighbors. God is making his appeal. He's wanting to speak to them and draw them to himself through you. In fact, Paul would say, we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. That God is wanting to reconcile. He's wanting to draw the world to himself 
through Jesus, through your witness as you are an ambassador for Christ. So every last one of us in this room are in full-time ministry. I'm not the only one. Our staff are not the only ones in full-time ministry. Every last one of you are in full-time ministry. You're like, Clayton, listen, I'm a teacher, I'm a coach, I'm an architect, I'm a lawyer, I'm a fireman, I'm a police officer, fill fill in the blank. That's my job, That's that's what I do. That's just your mission field. That's how you put food on your table. That, that's how you provide a, a home for your family to, to, to live in. That's how you make a paycheck. But according to the scripture, that's just the context where you make disciples of all the nations. That, that's, that's just your mission field because you are in full-time ministry no matter what your job might be. In Acts chapter 17, it says this, that God has determined the boundaries and the places where men and women live so that they might seek him. So God has put you in your home, in your job, in your school, in your sport, on that team, so that he can use you as an ambassador for Christ to reach your family members, friends, coworkers, and neighbors in those contexts, in those circles, you are in full-time ministry. One of the things we say at our house, you've heard me say this before, is that it's bigger than baseball, right? Or it's bigger than football, or it's bigger than basketball, or it's bigger than school. And when we, we talk about that, and when we remind ourselves of that, or when we remind our kids of that, what we're saying is that no matter what we're doing, we're doing it as if we are serving Christ and not men. And so we wanna do it in such an excellent way that it's a worship to Jesus, but at the same time, we wanna do it in a way where God can use us in that circle, in that space for his glory. It's bigger than that paycheck. Your job is bigger than your task list. You've got a mission everywhere you go. And so my question for you today is how many people have you shared your faith with? How many people have you brought to faith in Christ? Listen, it's why you're still here on this planet. It's why when you got saved and baptized, God didn't just zap you up to heaven. It's why we don't hold you under the water when we baptize you. Just send you straight to heaven, right? No, you come up out of the water. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive in Christ. And when you come up out of the water, it's like you've been commissioned as a missionary, ordained as an ambassador for Christ because God is making his appeal to the world through you. And here's what happens when Christians want to stay home live at home and just consume and play Xbox all day, right? Here's what happens, Acts 8, 1. In Acts 1, 8, Jesus sends his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I have a friend in India, he's a pastor, he's a church planner, and he says this, if you don't do Acts 1, 8, then Acts 8, 1 happens to you. You know what happens in Acts 8, 1? It says that God allows a persecution to come against his church in Jerusalem. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They're staying in Jerusalem. They're staying home. They're they're consuming. We're playing Xbox. God allows this persecution to break out in Acts 8, verse 1. And it says this in Acts 8, verse 4. And so the believers scattered and they preached the gospel everywhere they went. They went to Judea. They went to Samaria. They ended up going to the ends of the earth. If you don't do Acts 1-8, God lets Acts 8-1 happen to you because it's not a suggestion. It's not a question. It's a command. It's a matter of obedience or disobedience. God told Abraham, Abraham, I'm blessing you so that you might be a blessing to all the nations. Through you, Abraham, God said, all the nations on earth are gonna be blessed. I'm gonna bless you, but through you, all the nations on earth are going to be blessed. Listen, you and I, in the exact same way, we've been blessed with the gospel so that we can bless other people with the good news of the gospel. It's a matter of obedience or disobedience. Secondly, we've been sent 
to all nations. That word is ethne. It means all the families on earth, all the people groups on earth. In Genesis chapter 12, we just talked about this. When God told Abraham, Abraham, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna make your name great. And through you, all the nations on earth will be blessed. There it is again. In the very beginning, all the nations on earth will be blessed through you. This is all the people groups on earth. And Jesus says, we are to go to all the people groups on earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to all the people groups on earth, telling people the great news of the gospel. The gospel must go to all nations because Jesus is Lord of all the nations. In Revelation chapter seven, we get this vision, this picture of heaven that John sees. And it says this in Revelation chapter seven, that there will be a people from every tribe, from every language before the Lamb of God one day worshiping Jesus. A people from every tribe, from every language. Heaven will be a multicultural people worshiping a perfect savior together forever. That's what God is doing. You're like, what is, what is God's will? What, is he, what does he want for my life? Uh, he wants you to go and make disciples of all the nations. That's what he wants. That's his will. That's what he's doing. And that's what he's bringing about. In Revelation 7, a people from every tribe and language worshiping the lamb of God, that is Jesus. Towards the end of Acts, one of the Roman governors says about the church, that they are turning the world upside down. The gospel was spreading, disciples are making disciples, churches are being started and planted and multiplying. They're, they're, the gospel spreading throughout Rome so much and so fast because every believer is a missionary and every believer is in full-time ministry. It starts spreading and multiplying so fast that a leader in Rome says, these guys, these Christians are turning the world upside down. How cool is that? That as we go and are obedient to preaching the gospel, the world could be turned upside down. We are sent to all nations. Next, we are sent with a message. We're sent with a message. We saw this last week. Jesus said that the message is that he died and rose again. And then here, here's what he says in Luke chapter 24, that here's the message, that there is forgiveness for those who repent. Forgiveness of sins for those who repent. In other words, there is no forgiveness of sins for those who don't repent. There's forgiveness of sins for those who repent. To repent means I'm heading this way, I'm living this way, I'm doing things my way, I come to understand the gospel and I repent. I turn from my old way of thinking and from my old way of living, I put my faith in Jesus and I begin to walk with him and I begin to follow him. That's repentance. It's a turning around and going in another direction, not the direction I was headed. I'm going in this new direction. That's repentance. And Jesus says there is no forgiveness of sins without repentance. In other words, the great news of the gospel that Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins and that he rose from the grave conquering sin and death is only available to those who by faith trust in Jesus and give their lives to Jesus. In other words, the reason Jesus is sending us to all nations is that they might hear there is only forgiveness of sins found in Jesus' name. If, if everyone was saved because of what Jesus did, then we wouldn't have to go to all the nations and tell them. But because there is only forgiveness of sins for those who repent, we must go, we must be witnesses and tell people about the great news of the gospel. But here's what this also means. That just because you prayed a prayer or checked a card means nothing. Oh, Clayton, I, I, I recited the sinner's prayer. That prayer is not anywhere in the Bible. You can't find that prayer. We're, we, we don't believe in witchcraft, which means you just say some incantation and all of a sudden it means something's true. 
Jesus said, there's no forgiveness of sins unless you turn from your sin and you give your life to Jesus, meaning that your life should look different. It should look a whole lot different. That when you meet Jesus, there's a transformation that happens. And God says in the new covenant, which is what we are under now, that when you give your life to Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. And it gives you a hatred for sin and a love for holiness and righteousness. So there's a change that happens. I'm headed this way. I'm living this way. I'm walking in my sin and unbelief. I understand. I believe the gospel. I turn. I begin to follow Jesus. God puts his spirit in me that gives me a hatred for my sin and for my old way of living and a love and a passion for holiness and righteousness. There's a drastic transformation and change there. And if there hasn't been that transformation, and change in your life where you've turned from your sin and you now follow Jesus. It doesn't mean you don't screw up. It doesn't mean you don't stumble, but there's not this passion to know Jesus and repent of sin and walk in holiness. If there hasn't been that kind of change or there's not that kind of passion in your life, then you're probably just playing a game and you've deceived yourself into thinking you're something you're not. You think because you prayed a prayer or check a card that makes you right with God. It doesn't. There's forgiveness of sins for those who repent in Jesus' name. Peter said this in Acts 4, verse 12, there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be saved. No other name except Jesus. So it's not doing better, it's not trying harder from this day forward. No, it's repenting of your sin and trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, giving your life to him. And there's this transformation that happens. We talked about this last week. There's a regeneration that happens by the power of God. Uh, it, it, it's a miracle God where you are born again spiritually with the Holy Spirit living inside of you, giving you a passion for Jesus. We're sent with a message. And that message is that there is life in Jesus' name. But as Jesus would say, if you reject the son, and you have no life. There is no life outside of the name of Jesus. Next, we are sent in spite of the cost. We are sent in spite of the cost. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Luke chapter 24, uh, in, in Acts 1, eight. you will be my witnesses. Witnesses comes from the Greek word martis. It's where we get the word martyr. And so what Jesus is telling his disciples when he tells them, you're gonna be my witnesses, Here's what he's saying. You're going to be a public witness of me. You're gonna testify about me publicly in spite of the cost. That's what it means to be a witness. That whatever the cost, whatever the sacrifice, I'm going to be a witness for Jesus, even if it costs me my life. Now, today in our country, the cost for being a witness could be rejection. It could be humiliation. It could be a relationship. Jesus said, they hated me. If you follow me, they're gonna hate you too. Now, we don't wanna be hated because we're jerks or because we get in arguments on social media or throw truth grenades on social media at people. If we're hated for being jerks, then we need to repent of that sin. But Jesus said, if you follow me, if you love me, if you believe what I believe and you're a witness of Jesus, they're going to hate you. And we're seeing in our country a growing rejection and reviling of Christians and of what we believe. And I believe it's going to get more and more costly to be a Christian in our country to be a follower of Jesus in our country. It's going to get more and more costly. It's gonna cost us more than just relationships. It's gonna cost us more than popularity. It's going to get costly. And for some of us, we have lost relationships because we've been a witness for Jesus. And for some of us, we, we don't share the gospel with our family, friends, family members, friends, coworkers, and neighbors because of the fear that we have of the loss of that relationship. But, but let me just ask you to consider something here for a moment. 
Would you rather lose that relationship in this life because you were a witness for Jesus because you cared about the eternal destination of their soul? Would you rather lose that relationship because you shared the truth of the gospel? Or would you rather lose that person eternity in hell forever? You see, my guess is on that day, there's gonna be some people cursing our names because we did not share the gospel with them. They're gonna say, how could you, how could you not tell me the most important thing ever in this life? Why were, how could you not plead with me? How could you not pr pray for me and plead with me and, and, and share with me? Like, how could you, like, how much, if we really believe what we say we believe, how much do we have to hate somebody to not tell them the truth of the gospel? If we really believe what we say we believe, how much would we have to hate somebody to not share the one thing that can save their souls? We are sent in spite of the cost. But then finally, we are sent with power. In verse 49, Jesus said this, you're gonna be my witnesses, but you're gonna go back into the city, you're gonna to gather together and you're gonna wait for my spirit to come and to anoint you with power because you're going to need my help. You can't do this on your own, so go into the city and wait for my spirit. And when my spirit comes upon you, it will come upon you in power and you will do what you could not do on your own. It's why it says in Acts chapter two that Peter stands up, he raises his voice and he begins to preach the gospel to this crowd. Not long before that, he's hiding in fear and denying Jesus. What's changed? Well, he's been filled with this power. It's why it says in Acts 2 that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit now, stands up, raises his voice, and addresses the crowd. We can't do what Jesus is telling us to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's work to convict and convert. And what Jesus said is when you open your mouth for me, when you open your mouth and you begin to tell your story, share your faith, talk about Jesus, my spirit will give you the words to say. So we open our mouths and Jesus gives us the words to say, but then we're promised that the Holy Spirit then will go to work to convict people of their sin and to convert their souls. So we open our mouths and the Holy Spirit will do the work. It's my hope week in and week out. You know, how many times I'm coming to this place or before a service and just overwhelmed with this burden, this grief that, that nobody is going to care about what we're talking about. That's the, that's the temptation. That's what the, 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 the devil's trying to tell me on my way here every morning before every service, nobody cares, Clayton, you're wasting your time. So my only hope in me not wasting my time and yours is not in my ability, but it's in the Holy Spirit's work to convict, to convert, to transform. That's my hope. My only hope that you even understand anything that we're talking about right now is that the Holy Spirit, Paul said, is helping you discern spiritual truth because without the Spirit, you can't even understand what we're talking about. So it's our job to open our mouths. It's the Holy Spirit that comes and works and convicts and converts and transforms. We need the power of the Holy Spirit because Paul said there is a veil that the God of this age, that's the devil, has put over the minds of unbelievers. So they cannot see the beauty of the gospel. They can't see the beauty of the cross. And so we need God to come in the power of the Holy Spirit and remove that veil. And so... We preach, we open our mouths, and we pray for God to do something in your heart, in my heart, in our friends' hearts, in our family members' hearts, our coworkers' hearts, our neighbors. We, we preach and we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and to do what we cannot do. We are sent with power from the Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't an arrogant power. It's not a domineering kind of power. No. It's like what pastor and theologian D.T. Nile said, evangelism, being a witness, is just one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. 
the spirit that we receive, it's a spirit of humility. There's passion there, there's urgency, there's boldness, there's courage, but, but it's done with humility and kindness and respect. Peter said this in 1 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, that we share the gospel, we preach the gospel with gentleness and respect. Not arrogantly, not like a jerk, but with gentleness and respect. Just one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. One of the passengers on board the Titanic was a pastor from Scotland named John Harper. Well, when the Titanic struck the iceberg, John wrapped his six-year-old daughter in a blanket and put her in a lifeboat and told her that he would see her again one day. He then began to go around the ship shouting women, children, and the unsaved into lifeboats. Believers were ready to die. Unbelievers were not ready to die. So women, children, and unbelievers into the lifeboats. As he went around the decks, people said he was preaching for people to turn to Christ and to be saved. And as the ship began to sink, he jumped in the freezing water and began to swim to everyone he could reach, pleading with them to turn to Christ and be saved. John then sank in the freezing water at age 39. Four years later, at a church meeting in Canada, a young Scotsman, Aguilla Webb stood up at a church meeting in Canada and he gave this testimony. I am a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on some wreckage that night, Mr. John Harper swam over to me and asked me if I was saved. I said, no. He replied, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He swam away to go and ask other people that same question. Are you saved? He came back a little later to me. He said, are you saved now? He said, no, sir, I'm not. He said again, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Shortly after that, John sank in the water. Aguila said, there alone in the night, I believed and I was saved. I am John Harper's last convert. You see, you don't realize it, but you and everyone you know are on the Titanic. Every last one of us have a death sentence. 10 out of 10 of us are gonna die unless we're alive when Jesus returns, you're going to die. Your family members, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, they're going to die and you don't know when. You don't know their last day. You're on the Titanic, they're on the Titanic. John just knew he was. And so he made the most of those last few moments he had alive on this earth to preach the gospel to every last person he could find. He knew he was on the Titanic. You, you and I, we, we kind of forget, but you and I and everyone you know are on the Titanic and there is nothing more important that we can do in this life than to be a witness for Jesus. So Jesus sends his disciples out to make disciples. Secondly, Jesus ascends into heaven. Chapter one, last part of Luke. Jesus sends. Chapter two, Jesus' last moments here on earth, Jesus ascends. In Acts chapter one, again, the mirror passage to Luke chapter 24, it says in Acts 1 that they watched Jesus go up, ascend into the clouds, up into heaven, and some angels came and said, stop staring. Like, what are you staring at? Jesus has gone into heaven. And then they say this, he will return in the same way you saw him go. In other words, Jesus is going to come back, and when he returns, he's going to come down from the clouds. And his kingdom will come, and he will reign on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus goes and the angels say he's going to return in the exact same way you saw him go. So first of all, here's what we gotta understand. Jesus ascends to a place, not to a cloud in the sky, not to some ethereal or immaterial existence. Jesus ascends to a literal place. In Ephesians chapter one and 1 Peter chapter three, Paul and Peter both say that Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father 
that he is on a throne at the right hand of a father. He ascends to a place. Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology said this, this welcoming into the presence of God and sitting at God's right hand is a dramatic indication of the completion of Christ's work of redemption. Just as a human being will sit down at the completion of a large task to enjoy the satisfaction of having accomplished it, so Jesus sat at the right hand of God, visibly demonstrating that his work of redemption was completed. Just like Jesus said on the cross, it's finished. It's done. Their fine, their penalty has been paid in full. He rose from the grave three days later, conquering sin and death. Jesus accomplished everything that the Father willed for him to accomplish. And when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, he sat down demonstrating that his mission on earth was complete. It was done. It's finished. Jesus ascended to a place, to the right hand of the Father. Secondly, Jesus ascends to reign, to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. The act of sitting at God's right hand is an indication that he received authority over the universe. As Paul said in Ephesians 1, God raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and he reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. First Peter 3, Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of the Father with the angels, authorities, and powers all subject to him. Peter said in Acts 2, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. He's King of kings, he's Lord of lords, and everything is subject to him. Everything in the earth, on the earth, under the earth is subject to him. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, quoting from Psalm chapter 110, that Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Jesus ascends to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Next, Jesus ascends to serve, to serve. About 80% of the book of Hebrews talks about Jesus being our eternal high priest and how he makes intercession for us. I cannot wait to preach through the book of Hebrews and the way it connects the old covenant to the new covenant. But Hebrews makes it clear that Jesus ascends to heaven to serve as your eternal high priest. Daryl Bach in his commentary on Luke said this, Jesus departed into the heaven from which he came he did, he did so not to leave us, but to guide us, not to disappoint us, but to intercede for us. He departed with a blessing. He departed to equip us. Jesus lives, Hebrews says, to make intercession for us. That means Jesus is for you. And that means that Jesus right now at the right hand of the Father is praying for you in the same way he prayed for Peter when he told Peter, Peter, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat, but I'm praying for you. That's Jesus in his role as our eternal high priest. And that's what he's doing right now. In fact, Jesus is praying for you right now in this moment. That you will listen to him, that, you, that, that, you, that you'll see the beauty of the cross, the beauty of the gospel, that you will have spiritual eyes to hear, to see and to hear and to understand. He's praying for you right now. He's our eternal high priest priest. And before he left, he blessed them. And then he ascended into heaven. Most scholars believe this is the priestly, ironic blessing from Numbers chapter six, which goes like this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. This is the priestly blessing that Jesus is praying over his disciples before he ascends to heaven where he will serve as our eternal high priest, making a way for us to the Father. Next, Jesus ascends to foreshadow. He ascends to foreshadow our own ascension, our own what we call glorification, that when we die, though our body goes to rest in a grave, our soul instantly goes to heaven with Jesus. So Jesus ascends to foreshadow our own ascension. As Jesus would say in John chapter 14, 
I've gone to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. And when I go and prepare this place for you, Jesus said, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So whether you die and go to heaven to be with Jesus or you're alive when Jesus returns, that process is called glorification. And Jesus' ascension and his glorification of dying and receive this new, resurrected, glorified body is a foreshadowing of our ascension and our receiving that resurrected body one day. Christ ascends to foreshadow our own ascension. And then finally, Jesus ascends, ascends in order to return. In Acts chapter one, Jesus, the disciples, or the, the angels rather, when Jesus ascends to heaven, the angels tell his disciples, hey, quit looking up into heaven. Jesus has gone into heaven and he will return in the exact same way you saw him go. And his kingdom, remember he's reigning. He's reigning on that throne. His kingdom will come to earth and he will reign on earth just like he reigns in heaven one day. His kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven when Jesus returns. So the disciples have been consuming all of these things from, from Jesus over their three years together, right? And we learned last week, this is what a Christian believes. And this is what the disciples have been consuming. Number one, the incarnation, that Jesus is God in a bod. He's the word who became flesh. As Paul would say, all the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus in bodily form. Secondly, they've learned about and consumed propitiation, which is just a big word that means the sacrifice that takes away the wrath of God, that in the crucifixion, Jesus' death satisfies the wrath of God for your sin and my sin when we give our lives to him. They've seen and consumed resurrection, that Jesus is raised to life for our justification, and that in the resurrection, Jesus conquers sin and death. He proves himself to be the son of God. And he says, I'm the resurrection of life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, will live. Next, we've seen regeneration, that you must be personally born again, that it's not enough just to believe some intellectual facts about Jesus. Even the demons believe but you must be, as Jesus would say, born again. That these things didn't just happen, but the understanding that I need Jesus. I need the cross. I need Jesus to rescue me from my sin. That's regeneration. When you are personally born again because you encounter Christ and you repent of your sin and you turn to Christ. Next, we've seen commission. That Jesus sends his disciples to be disciple makers and witnesses in all the nations. We've now seen as his disciples did ascension that Jesus ascends to heaven to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and serve as our eternal high priest. We've seen glorification that as Jesus died and came back to life and ascends to heaven, he receives this new glorified body and Jesus says where he is, we will be with him and one day receive a resurrection body just like Jesus. And then finally we see revelation Jesus says, I'm coming back. And so the disciples have been consuming all of this, just like you and I through our study of the gospel, we've been consuming all of this, but now the disciples, they've been consuming and Jesus sends them out and ascends into heaven and we see their reaction in verse 52 and verse 53. It says, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And it says this, they spent all their time at the temple praising God. So they start gathering together and worshiping and, and, and praying together. And they know because Jesus has told them they're gonna receive the Holy Spirit. They're gonna be filled with power to be his witnesses. And so they're fired up. They're excited. They're filled with joy. Daryl Box said this in his commentary on Luke. Many people wish that they lived in the Old Testament times of great miracles. To see Moses or Elijah at work would have been inspiring. But Luke's perspective here is that these Old Testament saints would have seen our era as the blessed one. What they worked toward and even prophesied about met its realization in Jesus. And now in the new covenant where God's spirit indwells us. And so the disciples are filled with joy they're filled with joy. But let me ask you, why? 
These people are poor. They've got next to nothing. Jesus has told them, if you follow me, the world's gonna hate you. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be reviled. And then he says, you're gonna be my witnesses, which means you're gonna give your lives. Literally. In order to be a witness of me. What's to be fired up about? They've got nothing. The world hates them and they're gonna die for their faith. And they're excited. They're filled with joy. They, they can't stop coming together and worshiping and, 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 and praying. What, what are they excited about? They've got, according to this world standards, right? They've got nothing to be excited about. They've got nothing. People are gonna hate them and they're gonna die for their faith. And Jesus is blessing them and they're filled with joy and they can't stop meeting together and praying together and worshiping together. What is happening here? You see, for way too long in our country, we, we, we've gotten into this religious routine where we just, we, we think the Christian life is just kind of showing up to church. And so we, we, we watch our, our, our watches and we look at the clock and we think about what's next and we're bored to tears and, and, and we, just, we get caught in this religious routine and we're thinking, what, what is all the excitement about? Why, why are these guys so filled with joy when I'm bored to tears? For way too long in this country, we have been asleep, bored to tears, just going through religious routine. But after everything these guys experienced, they are filled with joy. They've got nothing, the world's gonna hate them, they're gonna die, and they're excited about it. They're filled with joy. What do these people have that we don't? What, what, have, what have they seen and experienced? What do they believe? What, what is happening in them that we so often miss? What, <laughs> let's make it a little bit more difficult. How about that? Um, what's going on in them where their suffering and their discomfort leads them to gather together more. When our suffering or our discomfort pushes us away. I don't get what I want. I don't get what I, what I want when I want it. It's not how I wanted it. So God must not love me. We are the most comfortable generation that's probably ever lived on the face of the planet. And we are bored to tears. These guys have nothing. The world's gonna hate them and they're gonna die. And they're filled with this inexpressible joy. But you know what my guess is if you went and asked my father-in-law who serves out at Hope City or any of the other volunteers that serve out at Hope City where our, our, our ministry to, uh, to those in jail, we've got three to 400 men that join us every week and about five different services and small groups all throughout the week. They're on the front lines sharing the gospel and worshiping together with these men and praying for, praying for them and, and, and seeing some of them get out and get involved in our church and get into to, to small groups. You talk with some of those guys, they're not bored. They're on the front lines. I bet if you went and talked to Adam Reinhardt or to Sanja and our, our prayer team members that, that pray during the services and they pray for people after the services and God gives them words and prayers to pray over people right in their situation. I bet you, I bet you they tell you they're not bored. God's using them in powerful ways because they're not just consuming, they're contributing. They're on the, the front lines. I bet if you ask Sandy Gomez about delivering all the gift cards we raised, all of our single moms with those care packages, and what her week was like, I bet you she'd tell you she wasn't bored. She might tell you it was one of the best weeks of her life. I bet if you went and asked Fabian, who got saved in the jail where we serve, 
and his life's been transformed and now he hosts a Bible study for other guys that have gotten out of jail at his workplace. I bet you tell you, he's not bored. He's on the front lines, he's contributing, he's, he's making disciples. I bet if you asked Haley Howe about what's happening in our foster care and adoption ministry, she'd have some stories to tell you because we have people taking next steps to get licensed to foster kids and to adopt kids. I bet if you ask the Flores family or the McSweens and they're serving in our youth ministry and what God's doing there, they would tell you they're not bored. I bet you if you ask Brandon or the, the Hayes about re-engage and all that God is doing to heal marriages through re-engage, I bet you tell you they're not bored. I think if you ask Caleb Howe, who started serving in our city kids ministry not long ago, and he told Amber after one of the services a couple of weeks ago or something like that, he said, man, I had no idea what y'all were doing in here. Y'all are really discipling our kids. You see, when you're on the front lines, you're not bored. God's using you and it's, it's exciting. It's fun and there's victory and miracles and then defeat and then more victory and, and, and more miracles and there's rescue happening and there's people being equipped and we've got vision for so much more. It's not boring on the front lines. I know a lot of you, this is church, but we can still be real. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the documentary on Johnny Menzel. And the whole thing's a train wreck, right? It's just a train wreck. It's, it's, it's so, so sad. And there's so many sad things in it. There's the potential that this guy had in football. And it's sad to see that potential go unrealized, but it's not the saddest part of the whole show. The saddest part is you have a man who's had money and he's used that money to do everything that he possibly can in this life to distract him from what he said was an emptiness inside of him. He's sitting in a mansion in Arizona, tons of money. He's partied his little heart out He's had fame, money, comfort, alcohol, drugs, women, everything. You, you name it, he's done it. And he said in that documentary, in his mansion in Phoenix, I'm empty. None of it satisfies. And you can still see he's empty because none of those things can ever satisfy. It's almost as if Jesus was right, that when we hold on to this life, we actually lose it. But you know what Jesus would say? If you will die to yourself, die to this life, lose your life for my sake, you will find real life that you were created for. Paul said, we're fools for Christ's sake. We're fools for his sake. And so much so, Paul would say this, that if we're wrong, then we are to be pitied more than anyone else on the face of this planet. Why would Paul say that we should be pitied? If we're wrong, he said we should be pitied more than anyone else on the face of the earth, that we Christians, disciples of Jesus, we should be, if we are wrong, we should be pitied more than anyone else on the face of this planet. Maybe it's because Paul was saying that he gave up his life and that disciples of Jesus give up their life in such a way that it's such a sacrifice, but in doing so, we find real life and we find that knowing and following and serving Jesus is better than anything else. Like Paul would say in Philippians 3, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing, following, serving, and worshiping Jesus. And that's the Gospel of Luke. Would you pray with me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just just a moment between you and God. 
And some of you are here today and you've been holding on to, to this life, thinking that you could find it. But hear Jesus telling you today, if you will give up this life for my sake, you'll find it. You'll find real life. You'll, you'll find this joy that these early Christians, this early church experienced that, that even having nothing and the world hating them and, and, and death awaiting them, that they were filled with joy. That could be yours. But there's no forgiveness of sins without repentance, Jesus would say. And so some of you are here today and you've been trying to do better and try harder your way into the kingdom of God, thinking that you could be good enough to have a relationship with God. And the scripture says, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done. You can't do better and try harder your way into the kingdom of God. You must be forgiven of your sins by your faith in Jesus. And so if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus before, today is your day, now is your time to give your life to Jesus. And if that's you and you're ready to turn, to repent and give your life to Jesus and trust in Jesus's payment of your fine for sin through his death on the cross, and take out that connection card and the seat back in front of you, fill it out, check the box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ. Take it to our welcome center in the lobby after the service. We've got a team there that wants to pray with you, celebrate that decision with you and point you in the right direction. And then for the rest of us, God, I pray that by your spirit, you would show us and transform our hearts to believe that Jesus is better. He's better than anything we've got. He's better than anything we've got going. He's better than anything that's coming up. Jesus is better. And he is surpassingly greater than anything this world has to offer. And so Holy Spirit, stir our hearts with a passion to love, follow, serve, worship Jesus, that we would lose our lives for his sake and in doing so, find it. It's in his name we pray, amen. Would you stand as our team leads us in worship?